Hello, everyone. As I told you earlier today, I was going to make uh, give you a video on the book that I am currently finishing up my uh, analysis book. And what I realized is I was going to originally share 10 propositions with you, but I just realized that it's going to take me forever. Uh, I've already typed it up on the typewriter, but by the time I, I copy everything onto Microsoft Word, it's going to take me hours for a video. And I don't, I don't think, I don't think it's uh, in, you know, overthinking it. I don't think it's smart to do that because number one, it takes a lot of my time to do it. But number two, I think that if you're, if someone is really interested in a book, uh, they will, it, based on what I'm going to show them today, it should be sufficient uh, for, uh, to meet your, your curiosity, uh, to fulfill your curiosity. But the book itself, it's, it's not math for dummies. This is going to be a, a math book for the disciplined mind. It's for the student who prefers precision over flash. If you prefer depth over distraction and the truth over trend. It's going to offer you, my intention is to offer you a rigorous foundation in real analysis, unfiltered. You're going to get sequences. You're going to get series. You're going to get continuity, differentiation, integration. And each topic I endeavor to present with clarity, I hope elegance, and respect for the subject. I have tried to make the proofs meticulous, but not pedantic. The exercises, are, uh, there, there are exercises in the book, and the theory builds with the kind of logical integrity that separates mathematical thinking from mere calculation. And we're living in a world that is obsessed with shortcuts and spectacle. But I refuse to compromise. So in the book, there are no gimmicks, no pastel colored uh, sidebars, and there's no attempt to make it math relatable. Relatable to what and to whom? Instead, it's a return to form where ideas are king and rigor reigns. I try to introduce you to a lot of topics in the book, and there are multiple proofs multiple proof methods uh, to train your mind to see deeper. So it's really a textbook if you are ready to leave behind the noise and approach mathematics with the seriousness it deserves. It's a textbook for the student who seeks not just technical fluency, but intellectual formation. For those who understand, if you, if you see that mathematics is not a set of tricks, but it is a liberal art. And I say liberal in the good sense of the word, not in the, in the modern sense of the word that people use it today. Um, I am referring to liberal arts, a study in reason, uh, in order and truth. Its goal is really not for test preparation, although there's nothing wrong with that. I'm all for tests, but that's not the goal of this book. It's really the goal is an initiation into a tradition older than the printing press itself. And it's more enduring than fashion. Uh, it does assume knowledge of at least Calculus 1, however. If you do not have any exposure to Calculus, this book is not for you. But don't fret. I am also working on another book that is, uh, but that will take a little bit longer to come out because that one is for students who really want to detox themselves from the fluff and from all the nonsense that uh, the, all the fake nonsense that they've been taught in schools uh, with math and the other. So it's going to primarily be for students who really want to get serious about their algebra, their school algebra. And I take a more of, it's a very similar approach to Dolciani. So that's my intention in that other book. However, that's not coming out as of yet because I've had a lot of things to do. I'm always overwhelmed because uh, I never would have expected really that, city tutoring would have been so successful and it's just growing. We are growing and, um, you know, eventually based on the number of students I have, I think I'm going to have to get, uh, probably more teachers. Uh, but that's also challenging because we want, of course, the right kind of teachers. We want the right kind of fit. We also run, by the way, we also want the right kind of student. City tutoring is not for everyone. It's for students who actually, uh, know, 
that who want a classical education uh, in the classical sense of the world of the word humanities, liberal arts, etc. Uh, in the days before all the technicality started to come and all this obsession with oh you have to have a PhD in this and you have to have this and all this career minded uh, mentality that we have starting after the Second World War. City tutoring is not for you if you have that kind of thinking. It's more for students who want to be, I almost consider it to be like a finishing school for ladies and gentlemen, as universities used to be. So I maintain that tradition alive. But anyway, uh, so as I said, I, I am, unfortunately, I will not have time to give you 10 propositions because I would have to type up everything that's already typed and it's just redundant. But I, I did uh, transcribe for you the first proposition so that you can get a feel of what the book is going to actually look like. So uh, here goes. All right, so notice this is going to be um, chapter one. So in chapter one, I start with the real number system. By the way, the, the, the font that I use is, uh, you know, I'm typing it on a typewriter. So it's going to be as if you were reading something that was typed on a typewriter. I use an I, for, for, for this book, I use an IBM Selectric from 1985 and uh it's a it's a little bit tricky with the math symbols because i have to constantly change the um the ribbon for that but uh it, it you know it's just something i do it not because of any conviction i do it because i've when i was an undergrad and when i first started writing papers i always used the typewriter something about the clicking of the of the keys that helps me concentrate on what i'm doing so uh, i often spend hours on the typewriter but but anyway, this is what we've got. Chapter one, we start there. Like I said, there are no images in the book. Forget about that. I'm not going to waste my time drawing things. If I, We don't need to in math. Not, not Certainly not in, for this book. So we have the real number system. And in this chapter, we consider, uh, this is what it says uh, that we, you will be reading. We consider properties of the real number system that are essential for a proper understanding of the basic concepts of calculus. However, the details of proof in the first two sections of this chapter may be omitted on the first reading by the beginner. And then we go on and notice that I use um, a script for, the, for some headings. So part one, we have on integers, rational numbers, and irrational numbers. The set N of positive integers, natural numbers, satisfies two important properties. We shall state these properties and establish their equivalents. And then I go on and talk about the well-ordering principle. That is, any non-empty set of positive integers has a smallest member. Then we talk about the principle of mathematical induction, which I'm, I hope some of you, or at least most of the people watching, are familiar with that. And then here is the first uh, proposition. Proposition one. The number one is the smallest positive integer. And I give you two proofs. Proof one, based on the principle of mathematical induction. We're going to say, let S be the set of all positive integers greater than or equal to one. Clearly, one is in S. So if the integer called N is in S, then N is greater than or equal to one. Thus, N plus one has to be greater than N, and N has to be greater than or equal to one. And so the integer n plus 1 is in s. It follows from the principle of mathematical induction that s equals n. And therefore, each positive integer is greater than or equal to 1. I have another proof here based on, so that was based on mathematical induction. This one is based on the well-ordering principles. It follows from the well-ordering principle that there is a smallest positive integer, say s. Assume that s is less than 1. If you multiply the inequality, 0 is less than s, right, and s is less than 1, if you multiply that by s, you obtain 0 is less than s squared and s squared is less than s, which implies that s is not the smallest positive integer. And since our assumption led to a contradiction, it is false, and therefore 1 is the smallest integer. A corollary to this. And those of you who are doing proofs, you know what a corollary is, I hope. If n is an integer, there is no integer between n and n plus 1. What is the proof of that? I said that suppose that there was an integer called k, 
such that n is less than k and k is less than n plus 1, well, that means 0 is less than k minus n, which is less than 1 would follow, contradicting that 1 is the smallest integer. And then I put here remark. You will often see that in my book, remark. Observe that the false claim there is a largest positive integer n implies that n squared equals n which in turn would mean that n would have to be equal to 1. So that is the structure of my book. I start with, uh, it's, it's just hundreds of, pro it's proposition, proof, remark, corollary, if it's applicable, proposition, 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 proof, proof, proof. And I hope it's going to be useful. So it's really an introductory. It's not, don't expect something like, you know, certainly not like a masterpiece, like, uh, you know, the, 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 the famous mathematical analysis books out there. Uh, it's more to, I, I'm writing it more so that you can, uh, to bridge that gap that so many students have between, you know, the, all the fluff and the nonsense to get you more into uh, rigorous thinking so that when you do pick up a one of the classics out there, you can really, really uh, understand wh what is said and uh, what it is that, uh, that, what is expected of you. So if this was helpful, like I said, please, please continue to support the channel. And uh, I am so pleased that there are just so many interesting people. I am just overwhelmed. I feel so enriched when I read so many of your comments. Every day I get interesting people. Yesterday I had a student. If you're watching this video, thank you for your comment. I don't know if you're male or female, but I couldn't tell by your username. But you said that you are in a uh, competitive district here in Virginia and that you said that in your advanced AP uh, calculus class, many of the students would not be able to solve the problems that we have on this channel. So uh, thank God there are people like you who are taking this very seriously. And uh, for those of you who want to, we need to create a movement. We need to create a movement in America to, uh, to pressure changes because uh, I know so many of you are sitting in classrooms and you're shaking your head because you know, you're, you're, you're seeing just how nonsensical everything is. And you're seeing it's become a clown world. That's that's really what it is. Uh, no discipline at all. No standards. And uh, you are suffering for that. So thank you all. And uh, tomorrow, those of you who are new to the channel, let me say this. There is a Sunday message. Every Sunday, there is a moral message. Some people like that. Some people don't. I don't do it because people like it. I do it because it's the, my duty to God. If you don't like absolute truths, if you don't like standards, this is not the right channel for you. We want the right kind of people on this channel. So I'm always very honest. Those of you who have been on this channel for a while, you know that uh, I'm all about honesty, truth and rigor. So uh, if you don't like to be told that there are absolute truths, you and I are not going to get along because I believe that there are absolute truths. And I believe that there's a behavior that has to be maintained, that there are standards that have to be respected. Thank you all.